right. Yeah, but we're free to look up at the floor too. It's like being an Indian. <laughs> Good afternoon to, to everyone and uh, welcome to the Negotiating with Platforms uh, online uh, workshop that ends uh, this first day of the Media Mutations 12 uh, conference. Uh, this uh, workshop has been organized jointly by the Media Mutations 12 Conference at Università di Bologna and by NEX, uh, the European Network for Cinema and Media Studies. I want to especially thank the co-organizers of the Bologna Conference, uh, Professor Paola Brembilla and Veronica Innocenti, as well as the Steering Committee and the Open Scholarship Committee at NEX, uh, who believed very much in this uh, first opportunity of starting a discourse around the platforms and how they impact on our research, on our work in television, media, screen studies. Uh, I want to thank very much Professor John Ellis, uh, who works at Royal Holloway, University of London, uh, who will give this afternoon a provocative speech from where we will start our discussion. The title is Netflix is destroying TV studies and what we can do about it. So it's quite provocative. Uh, and I want to thank also Miriam De Rosa and Jeroen Sondervan who will act today as discussants. Uh, thank you also to all the audience which is connected live on Facebook uh, or will watch the video in later times and later moments. Uh, before leaving the floor to the actual speakers uh, here, I just want to highlight uh, uh, that uh, today's workshop is mainly intended as a starting point, as a first moment, uh, fostering the discussion on these topics of uh, open access, open data, open scholarship, which are growingly impacting on our work, and that future occasions will bring ahead this discussion, will connect next with other associations uh, as ICRIA and other institutions who are already involved in this uh, very interesting discussion that will continue after this first step. Uh, we will also already think about uh, some other moments of joining the forces together uh, at the next 2022 conference uh, in Bucharest. But uh, now I've already spoken too much, and so uh, I, I'm leaving the digital floor uh, to Professor John Ellis uh, with his uh, speech. Okay, let's hope, uh, let's hope this works. Well, I'm, I'm very much uh, welcome the opportunity to, to raise this issue, um, which I think is, is um, really um, an important one for us in terms of our, our infrastructure and how we're going to teach in the future. Um, because this is why the streaming giants are putting us out of business. How can we plan our teaching if we don't know what programs are going to be available when we give our classes? How can we study television history when back catalogues suddenly get deleted? How can we study film when so many titles are no longer there, even on DVD? How can we create a common culture with our students when they don't have access officially to multiple subscriptions? course they have access to torrents maybe and what's the point of audience studies when we don't know anything but other people do what's the point of audience studies when there are petabytes of audience data to which we have no access whatsoever so the streaming giants are putting us out of business um, because they have this and we don't and it's worth looking at the history of film and television studies, which is a history of the gradual easing of problems of access. Film studies was born out of the circulation of 16 millimeter prints of films after 1945. And then it became a real activity with VHS cassettes, laser discs, DVD, Blu-ray and file sharing. Television studies similarly comes out of the VHS recorder of the late 1970s and then box sets and PVRs. In all of these cases, studies were able to happen because physical copies were controlled by users. They could be held in libraries 
for students to use, they were held in personal collections and they were circulated. And the copyright holders tolerated the multiple use and reuse and even the resale of all of these physical items. Now streaming reverses all of that advance. Streaming is a massive grab by the copyright holders. It reverses that 40 year history of physical users, have it physical copies being in the hands of users. Now the users are controlled by conditional access. Subscription gives you no rights and no guarantees. Texts are now controlled by the streamers again. So we can't get hold of them when we need them. And this, there's a similar situation in the area of audience research. Broadcast audience research was always shared because it was a shared resource between broadcasters and advertisers, or it was needed to justify the license fee. And further detailed quantitative data and even qualitative data can be bought by researchers. Researchers can even commission questions to go on to marketing research activities. And qualitative data can be developed from interviews, from notebooks, and from observation. So it's all public to some degree. But the streamers have a completely different attitude to audience data. Netflix is a data-driven corporation. And if you look around on, on YouTube for a year or two, you will find some videos from Netflix in 2017 when they were trying to re recruit uh, data engineers, where they talk about the kind of data they had. And this is, nine, this is 2017. This is five years ago now. At that point, they had detailed data on user behavior for over 10 billion viewing hours per quarter. That generated 500 terabytes of information daily. The integrated Netflix data hub, because anybody in, in, in Netflix can use the data, which is all held centrally, processed four terabytes of data daily. And that's back in 2017. So goodness knows what size of data they have on their users' activities now. So Netflix finds patterns in every choice of content, in every pause, and in every rewind. And it also finds content in, in the most unexpected um, um, coincidences of tastes. Netflix has a taste map, which is highly sophisticated, which they use internally. Netflix uses everybody's pause, rewind, and abandonment as a way of feeding into um, the structuring of scripts for their current productions. So it's being used right through the, um, the process. But all of this data remains highly confidential. We can't get access to it. Streamers are the enemies of television and film studies because they manage demand through scarcity and withdrawal. They withdraw useful features like my collections that used to be there. They have secrecy around their data collection use, but all of these are commercial decisions and they're not specific affordances of streaming. It doesn't have to be this way at all. Indeed, in the UK, we built an alternative called Box of Broadcast, which is a, a huge, collection of material from broadcast programs, which is available in perpetuity for as long as our servers stay, stay up um, for anyone in education. There's a copyright exception under UK law, and there has been since 1988, allowing schools and education in general to keep VHS tapes of programs. That's where it started from. And learning on screen developed an online version of this with the active cooperation of broadcasters. And it's a proud cloud crowd, sorry, a, a crowdsourced model. Anyone can choose a program, student or teacher, anyone can choose a program to be saved by Box of Broadcast by Bob. And then it is available to everyone forever. 
It's a crowdsourced model which has produced a collection which is now approaching almost 3 million television programs. So that's done with the, with the active help of the broadcasters. We also are building alternatives in academic publishing, just to mention VIEW, a peer-reviewed open access TV studies journal of European broadcasting. It's just about to celebrate its, its 10th anniversary. It's published by the Dutch Film and Television Archive. And um, I'm an editor of this journal. I'm telling you about this because it's a television studies journal of European television. And we really ought to be snowed under with offers of articles, but really we're not. And it affords something very useful as well, because it's online, you are able to integrate extracts into your articles, which no print journal is ever going to be able to do, I don't think. But that's another alternative um, to the major structures, in this case of academic publishing. But Bob is a way of using streaming differently. Bob uses the affordances of streaming to create access for study. So could streaming services. They could provide study access to their back catalog, but they don't. They could provide research access to some of the user data, but they don't. That's why they're putting us out of business. And so my recommendation is that we collectively as media scholars have to open negotiations with Netflix and the other streamers on an agreed list of our needs. They're not things we desire, they're actually things we need to carry on teaching and learning and researching the media. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to John for this uh, start of the discussion. The, the road that you propose in the end is quite of a difficult task. Uh, we are <laughs> kind of a dwarf uh, and uh, we are connecting with the uh, streaming uh, giants and platforms and, uh, and so on, but it's actually not so uh, not so improbable in a way because uh, at least in other portions of the knowledge for instance with Facebook or other platforms there has already been some discussions uh, with the academics uh, in order to give data to give access it's not always working well actually to be fair but uh, there have been some uh, pilot projects and why not in screen studies film studies television studies as well but uh, I'm giving the floor to the first of the discussant we have here, which is Miriam De Rosa from uh, University Ca Foscari in Venice. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Um, obviously, thanks to the organizers of the conference for, for having this session. And thanks to John for, uh, for, you know, sort of giving us so much um, food for thought and and maybe also some some weapons to sort of you know hopefully uh, keep on thinking together about these these issues which are really urgent. Um, so just briefly, and I, I'd really like to have, if possible, uh, the most you know interactive sort of conversation. And otherwise, I'm sure that my uh, um, uh, uh, colleague uh, Jeroen will will just you know we we will do a little bit of back and forth because um, we thought there are so many different points uh, that are crucial in in your presentation and that we also had uh, in mind uh, within Nex. So both Jeroen and I that's probably a, a caveat I have to make at the beginning of this conversation are part of the um, open scholarship um, uh, committee in Nex. and within that committee we've it, it's quite a while we've been thinking about these issues so clearly the idea of the data of very practical challenges like how are we going to teach you know, that, that, that's very beginning um, uh, of your talk. It, it's just so urgent uh, and it, it obviously touches all of us. So um, these questions are really what um, inspired and what um, sort of encouraged us a couple of years ago to start thinking about uh, an open scholarship statement that just last year during uh, the next conference uh, that we had, 
uh, virtual Palermo, uh, we, we approved at the general meeting. And this is something that um, you can find online on, on next.org. Uh, so basically, in this statement, there are so many points that you also touched upon. For example, this idea of accessibility, right? And um, obviously, um, in many instances of your, of your talk, just a while ago, I was thinking it really comes back to the fair use. So basically, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, um you know uh, sort of you know open data that we we really advocate for so clearly that applies to platforms that applies to audiovisual products that applies to publications as well which is our start which has been our starting point for the statement but in the end it really is I don't know, a sort of basis a sort of platform to to create this common culture with our students that you were talking about. And I think it, it really is a, a matter of, of accessibility, of findability, of, of smooth exchange and operability, if you like. Um, for that purpose, obviously, platforms are, are really important because they, they work on infrastructural, um, sophisticated uh, um, organizations. And these organizations also have barriers. There are infrastructural barriers, right? So having used Bob in my previous uh, uh, job in the UK, that was a great example of how to sort of cut some of those barriers and sort of open up the accessibility to, to students, for example. Um, but I do wonder, uh, whether there are ways in which a sort of model like the one that you um, sort of propose with, with uh, Bob is something that can be extended, that can be shared. Obviously, that is the main challenge, right? So as Luca was also saying, clearly, um, we are really holding this together, as, as, as cheesy as it may sound. Um, but all these different academic societies and groups I suppose we all really face the same challenges. So uh, my response, which is probably not a response, is just you know throwing uh, possibly more on the table to to further discussion is um, is really about how to to sort of um, create a front that can you know sort of negotiate a lowering of barriers and a sort of increasing of um, you know, this, this deepening of this common culture that you were talking about in, in the name of, of you know, of fair, uh, open, open data, probably. And I think that when it comes to data, this is something we were talking about with Jeroen, so maybe I will leave to him the, the, the word on, on data. I mean, obviously, when it comes to, to Netflix and, and, and the likes, we're really talking about, we, we are really entering a data fight sort of, you know, um, of, uh, of environment. So clearly the key is, is the data, right? Far more than the content in a way. So it shouldn't be, I suppose that that's, that's there to be discussed. I don't know whether Jeroen wants to chip in on this one. Yeah, so no, not not necessarily specifically on 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 the data itself, but um, I want to bring in a few things. Um, uh, so, for, for instance, if if we talk about open scholarship, that that also means um, uh, ownership. Who who owns what, right? Um, so, on on this side, the Netflix or the streaming companies are the producing. Uh, data uh, companies, um, not necessarily for their their entire database, right? Because they uh, stream uh, movies owned by others as well. Uh, but for their own products, this is really complicated, I think. Um, but ownership and control, these two aspects, I want to bring in um, to uh, to discuss. Um, and taking ownership as not only as, as individuals, but also as universities or the university systems and the societies connect, uh, uh, connected to those uh, universities um, uh, networks. Um, and so if I look at 
my own my background publishing uh, I'm, I'm i'm mainly active in, in in the open access debate so for publications um and just to give you a few examples what's happening there so uh, um, also there um uh, big commercial uh, entities are owning um, a huge amount of let's say the infrastructure and and, and all the things that are happening there um, and also ownership um, uh, in that sense so at the move towards open access um, and john you you showed a few i know you very very well um, uh, i've been involved at uh, at the est establishment uh, with uh, with nexus uh, the, the uh, european journal of media studies as well um, and, and those are examples of uh, scholars or scholar networks um, um, taking ownership. Um, and if I look at, for instance, what's happening with the big commercial uh, publishing companies, um, there too, um, they're sitting on their data, right? And they're sitting on a lot of data. Um, uh, also how people read, uh, what kind of uh, information they, they, they access, they use uh, on a library uh, level, um, for instance. Um, but in the open access debate, what we're now trying to do is, and that's negotiating with these commercial publishers, um, for instance, step by step. First, um, besides opening up their, uh, uh, their papers uh, based on certain business models, but also uh, other aspects like opening up their metadata, for instance, uh, or opening up their citation uh, data. These are um, small steps, but together they uh, create a big movement. Um, so uh, I totally agree with your final line that it is worthwhile to negotiate with these, these uh, very large, big uh, uh, commercial uh, entities and 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 stress the importance of, uh, of 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 maybe step by step, but opening up some of their data points uh, to enable researchers to do their to do their work. So, just a few comments um, about this on that respect. Do you want to respond to your discussants, John? Well, yes, I, I, mean, I think we have to, um, it, the, it's about, as Miriam says, it's about lowering the barriers because the barriers are going up. Um, that um, more and more the, the, the way that the um, television production business is going is, is the way that Netflix is, is beginning to push it, which is towards 100% ownership. Mm -hmm. um, that um, Netflix now says we won't, we don't go into co-production anymore. We won't anymore claim that this BBC stuff we've co-produced is a Netflix original. Um, we're just going to make it 100% ourselves. So they're 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 looking at a, a very exclusive inventory, which is one of the um, difficulties um, that we're going to face very soon. Um, I think we need to have some kind of agreed platform of what um, what we could achieve. And Jerome's experience with with the giants like Elsevier and so on is extremely useful in this respect. There are certain specific things that you can ask for. If you ask for everything, you will get nothing. But mm -hmm. if you ask for something specific, then um, uh, then you may well get it. Um, if we try also to um, uh, begin to try and, and make some kind of study alliance with these organizations because our students today will be their employees tomorrow. Um, so we have a common interest in that respect as well. So con to construct a careful negotiating package mm -hmm. is I think probably the next thing that needs to be done. And that's gonna be difficult because um, Partly, we don't know what to ask for, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I just chip in on this one? Yeah, I think that this, this final comment is, is probably the main point mm. because we have good ideas and, and some background, right? Yeah. However, it's really hard to, this is so fast paced and, and ever changing. <laughs> so I suppose it's really hard to, to go and, and pose the right questions mm. and sort of reclaim for the right 
I don't know, sort of aspects with specific requests, as you say. So I suppose that this is one side of the coin. The other one is that all of this just basically, to me, basically um, means this is this is literally cultural policy and and cultural policy in this case is just, you know, what brings a cultural transition, no less which probably is not the best way to, to approach Netflix and ask for, for stuff. Probably say, hey, can we do a cultural transition together? <laughs> um, but um, but that, that is what it is. To me, I, I really seems that there is so much on the table. Well, there, there are two fronts. There's a direct negotiation with Netflix, but mm -hmm. there would also be um, on, on the European level, <clears throat> which I can't participate in anymore, um, <laughs> on the European level, um, it would be to try and get the ear of yeah. policymakers because they are worried about these yeah. institutions for not dissimilar reasons, actually. Um, they're worried, you know, in, in countries like France, they're worried about mm -hmm. cultural specificity yeah. and the streaming uh, giants. Um, and so they're... they're we have common cause also with with legislators on on this one and we need to kind of get exactly as 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 uh, my forebears got in in the 1988 education act in in the uk mm -hmm. when there were in, or copyright act rather the copyright act when when that legislation was going through it was very easy to have written in an extra clause that says and will We'll, we'll iron out the anomaly that, that, that schools are being illegal when they keep VHS copies. It seemed to be an easy thing to do. Yeah. And so that kind of um, working on the legislative level as well, when that comes, and it'll be coming quite soon in relation to a lot of this, that's the other thing we have to be ready for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in effect, cultural policies and, you know, yeah. sort of involving legislators is really something pressing and important. Yeah. And probably it's so also, I kind of have the feeling that's probably the right moment to do that because there are so many sort of different drivers in Europe and 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 beyond obviously um that sort of can can push forward this this sort of of requests once we have a list of requests of course yes. <laughs> okay can I can I ask um um a question and maybe a, it's a it's a very dumb one but um um, how is, is is competition within the streaming services um, uh, could, could sort of facilitate this? Um, because Netflix has been the giant and still is, but now they have Disney and they have they have uh, many others um, entering the field, um, which which makes it maybe more um, feasible to to mm -hmm. now uh, to act now on, on on these questions. So is is that something feasible or well that that's 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 not a dumb question at all because um the difference between netflix and and the other streaming companies is is um that the other streaming netflix is is made on borrowed money mm -hmm. the other streaming companies um are far far bigger and far far more prosperous they're mm -hmm. amazon they're apple they are the existing uh, broadcasters and they are the, the, the entertainment conglomerates like Disney. So they are companies which have a very different sort of a base and a much longer history in um, dealing in, in various ways with, um, with scholars and, and with issues of archiving and public access and so on. So um, they may be easier targets. Netflix is the really difficult one. Mm -hmm. But Netflix is also the one which is making the running in this at the moment, um, because, you know, we've already heard papers where, where uh, the Netflix habit is something that very much younger, younger generations have. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, some of us are not sure whether in 10 years time we'll even know what the word Netflix is. <laughs> they will be, you know, they will have been taken over and, and, and um, because they'll be overwhelmed by their debts. Um, and they will have this magnificent catalog of, of programs that um, Apple buys or Disney scoops mm -hmm. up with everything else. 
Yeah, if we want to make an agreement with Netflix, it's better if they are not listening to us now pro, uh, forecasting this bad future, but okay. <laughs> they're not listening to us. I mean, this is one of the few points they're not listening. <laughs> That's kind of a certainty. Uh, yeah, probably we have also to unpack these issues of access. So we are talking about the access to text, uh, the access to data, the access to the research and the research results for teaching as well. Uh, um, as for instance, once again, another dumb question, but a thing to unpack uh, uh, on data, uh, the access to data is not connected because of the commercial reasons you already highlighted to the advertising system. And so while the platforms are slowly getting back the ad system with the product placement, with the live broadcasting, when you are streaming live sport events, you need to have verified data in order for the teams and for the sponsors to get an evaluation, a proper evaluation of what they are doing. With TV series, not, but with that, yes. So is not possible that uh, also for the economic problems of Netflix you were alighting, in a future at least the data part will be in a way forced to enter the commercial game that we are used to with broadcasters and so on. I do not know, of course, but. Well, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I, th I think that, that that would be the target is that kind of data that, that they will, would have to um, in the future release. I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff which is uh, fine grained data, you know, it's huge amounts of stuff. Um, and they do process it internally in very agile ways. Mm -hmm. And that's how they've designed their system. And that's their strength over everybody else, including Facebook and Amazon and so on, is the centrality of their data. Um, we wouldn't be asking for, um, for access to the raw data. We would be ac asking access to, as you say, reports, the results of, that um, in the same way as you, you, you want to get access to the internal reports of, of Facebook and, and Instagram, which are now leaking out. It's actually the results of that material that we're interested in. That's what's interesting for us um, to teach about media. People who are interested in, in, in dealing with very large amounts of data in, in computer sciences, they're, 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 you know, they're, they, they have a different uh, set of interests to us. Um, but ours, ours is actually in the kind of top level of findings rather than the raw data. And I think if that's the beginning of our kind of, um, the beginning of our um, uh, set of, of, of needs really, is that we need to know what actually is happening with the Netflix audience rather than the lies they tell us in public in order to make a quick publicity hit, which is actually what's going on at the moment. Yeah, we all have seen the data surrounding the Squid Game and uh, the many, many fans uh, that Netflix, of course, used as a promotional tool, yeah. counting very few minutes of watching as being fans of a long TV series. So, yes, uh, I mean that is a that is a that's a well that is already a well-known story, and it may well be they've overreached on on the Squid Game issue, and and that will reap a cast, and they may have to, as a result begin to release some real data <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> reputation management is <laughs> yeah, yeah. so there's a there's a sort of d dirty way of doing this uh, game as, as well as negotiating um face to face as it were okay i don't know if Jeroen has something to add to this since he's not here maybe it's more difficult to jump in the discussion so please do no if not yet yeah. I'm, I'm listening and, and but not now Okay, okay. So we can add other, other things. Uh, we were talking about asking for specific things to direct our efforts to the right people. Uh, what can we give them in return for this, since probably they are not doing that as philanthropy? Interns. <laughs> <laughs> Employees, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> or infiltrants. <laughs> that is very true. 
Yeah. We can give them inter, but we can also give them um, uh, basically down the line trained staff, staff who who know um, the company history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are still very new. Um, but what we've done for a long time with broadcasters is is to provide them with people who actually know what that broadcaster's internal culture is and where it comes from and 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 what its what its heritage is. That's been one of the very important functions of, of, of media studies over the years. As well as the other thing is, is possibly defense against the onslaught of, of kind of ignorant criticism. <laughs> that would be the best <laughs> yes, outcome. <laughs> that would be the best outcome. But we need to know, we need, need to be not ignorant to be able to do that. Yeah, That's yeah. The, and I was thinking when you were talking about interns, yeah. sorry, I see there is mm. a question, but mm. just super quickly. Um, yeah. um, that is probably part of of the game mm -hmm. which is to say of our job yeah. uh to sort of raise awareness regarding you know the importance of data and i, I remember teaching a tv mm. module last year and when i gave this reading regarding immaterial labor and the sort of harvesting of yeah. of, of data my students were okay now i'm watching netflix slightly differently right and it was like <laughs> well <laughs> so of course there is like a sort of you know very basic level where there is something that can be done in terms mm. of preparing mm. interns that are prepared yeah. and possibly critical in terms of you know using and operating within this environment sorry i didn't mean to stop you <laughs> yeah sanne heikner here from Maros university yeah, I have. Um, I was just wondering if you um, three or four or whoever is in uh, the room as well um, has more knowledge about how these negotiations with the um, universities, European universities and Facebook came to happen. Um, and what can we learn from that? Uh, I might, it might even be that my colleague Anja Bechmann was one of the ones who is in that committee, but I, <laughs> I'm just not knowledgeable about it. And uh, I would be really curious if you would know more. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I have actual, I actual, I'm, I'm uh, an actual answer to that. Uh, I know some of our colleagues in Italy as well from University of Urbino have been contacted. In a way, they have probably selected some of the universities which were more active in internet studies and so on. Uh, they use that also kind of a publicity stunt. Once again, uh, we are open. We are giving data to select the researcher. You have full access to investigate the fake news phenomenon on Facebook. Uh, then the data were not so consistent. Some of them <laughs> discovered that. So uh, kind of backfired also a bit. But uh, at least they had this access. They published on that data. They could analyze a bit of uh, the engine, not doing the reverse engineering. Probably it, it should be needed to understand very much Netflix as well, but at least it was a glimpse of, uh, of that. Follow up. So probably, yeah, obviously there's a bigger lobby behind uh, researching into fake news and everything that has to do with that. So I was, it's really curious that we don't find the political lobby on the European level behind that, because it's obviously um, also a very pressing matter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we probably should think about questions which have relevance uh, in order, uh, not, not just we want to research, but what do we want to research? What uh, in things that are considered everyday, banal, not important, artsy or stuff like that, uh, we, th what actually matters so much in order to make them give us the data and the access we are looking for? But uh, mm -hmm. so probably also not... Uh, asking for specific things as per the data we want to access, but also specific questions for our research uh, to use kind of a start. Well, one, one, one issue is, is the issue of versioning of um, different tastes in different markets. And if you address them as, as Europe in, in all its diversity, that's one, one real concern that um, so much of the material is, is, is produced in the different cultural contexts of the states um, that uh, doesn't work terribly well in Europe. And that's a standing kind of question for, for Netflix and not one that um, can particularly be answered um, from the existing behavior of, of users because it's, uh, 
it's you know they, they can't tell what's turning them off you know they tell that they are you know they are not liking this kind of thing um they are but but they don't know why and maybe it's that kind of explication the cultural explication on top of the numerical data that they have is is actually something that we can offer okay that's that's great another question probably another silly question just to continue this kind of brainstorming we are starting here and uh, to go towards the conclusion of our workshop uh, um, the the access to the text uh, is it not uh, an an issue which kind of affects uh, more or less all the contemporary digital media studies and not screen studies as a whole. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, all the web pages that are lost, uh, uh, all the profiles uh, on uh, past social network that are lost. Uh, the web archives does something, but to a point. And at the same way, if Netflix would uh, make some of its, show, its shows disappear, it can do that. Is it something that with uh, serial programs, films, uh, established uh, languages in some way can be different uh, or it's the same uh, digital plenitude as uh, Jay Bolter tells uh, that where everything can be lost and probably also should be lost at some point? <laughs> yes, I mean, you, you don't keep every ticket and every theatre programme. I mean, there, there, there is a huge category of ephemera that, that um, you know, enough of it exists from the past by accident that actually it's not terribly good to, um, to try and archive it deliberately. However, these are bigger things. These are, these are cultural objects. These are, um, a, a lot of work has gone into making them and so on. Um, and um, the same principles that lie behind um, the archiving of cinema film mm -hmm. um, should lie behind the archiving of television and increasingly does actually um, because broadcasters found out that there was commercial value in their old stuff um, so they began to keep their old stuff and we now have the instance of the BBC, which, which turns 100, you know, as a, as a radio broadcaster next year. And to celebrate its 100th birthday, this very old centenarian institution is going to make its, um, its whole archive accessible to education. And it's doing so using platforms that education already exists. That is Bob. Yeah. So... Um, We've got an unexpected windfall there, which is great. But but the print to go back to your question, the principles of ad, of archiving, and the archiving of cinema, um, need to be applied here as well. Simply because this is the cultural heritage of all the people who have seen enjoyed uh, these programs for whom they've been meaningful, and because they are complex cultural texts, they are cultural objects. And so they should be archived, they should be worked on, and they should be available for what used to be called the long tail, which has now been rather chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose uh, if I just might um, add one thing and maybe then we, we shall wrap up. Um, these, these issues of, of archiving really is, is quite important here. And I suppose that as, as a film studies scholar, uh, there is so much that has been done that can be used as best practice. Mm. So I suppose once again, it's very much back, going back to a very, you know, um, easy and, and um, <laughs> I would say, sort of um, clear uh, passage and transition, which means um, using the patterns that we created mm. and sort of, you know, relaunching them in in a way that they can be recontextualized uh, so that they can sort of you know embrace the challenges that sort of come up continuously because obviously there is a lot of um of of change uh, and it is very fast but things like the box of broadcasters for example i suppose there is there are principles that really sit on 
the work that has been done like more generally and more traditionally in terms of archiving and uh, obviously to sort of connect this with the idea and the sense of you know what do we want to ask what can we negotiate for and what specific requests do we have i just just probably just got back to the statement that we put together within next so that we can sort of you know round up our our conversation coming back to open scholarship we're sort the, of the, Try so, to, uh, so this could be one of the moral appeals to those platforms, right? Sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry. So this could be one of the moral appeals, right? Um, the, um, the the questions we ask to the to these platforms, the the purpose of archiving of these cultural products. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, it's true. Yeah. So yeah, I was just just trying to to get back to to the sense of how we we try to. To include some future actions in this statement and some final thoughts that are clearly open in the spirit of open scholarship, obviously, um, but are then and that can be implemented. So really, it's probably worth reminding that this is an open um, um, document that can be enriched and uh, uh, you know uh, open to edits, to amendments, to indications and anything that can serve this purpose that we are sort of you know fo focusing today and and sharing because clearly there is so much that is is urgent and so much that needs uh, you know to get policymakers on board mm. and to get legislators on board but also to get us as as teachers on board and our students as future professionals and yeah very possibly um, future interns uh, <laughs> on board. Um, so yeah, I just would invite you all to, to check the statement and feel free to, to let us know whether you have any suggestions on that one. We would like this to be the first stepping stone for future workshops to come, right? Yes, definitely. We, we wanted to keep this workshop very, very uh, short and quick, but at the same time, very, very dense and rich of, uh, of possibility. Of course, uh, as we were saying before, we are addressing very big issues and also finding the parallels between uh, large issues in their own uh, as uh, the idea of the open scholarship, uh, the open research, the open data, the open access to platforms uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, we are probably leaving this workshop with so many more questions and uh, not an answer, but we will try to approach at least some strategies to hopefully get also some solution for the next step of this path that we are starting here with this first attempt at NEX, at ICREA, at Media Mutations, uh, to kind of reflect about this crucial methodological element of, uh, of our studies and actually of our everyday life is quite ironic that we are starting this live on Facebook. And so with <laughs> other issues of access and openness and so That's on. The meta level, right? That's yeah, the I meta think, level yeah. we always <laughs> have as academics, of course. We cannot ex escape the meta discourse. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much for Professor John Ellis for having had this very early idea of starting this discussion that was later um, kind of collected by media mutations and by the next steering committee and the next uh, open scholarship committee. Thank you very much uh, to Miriam and, uh, and Yerun. And of course, uh, see you at the next uh, occasion, uh, which hopefully will involve also other associations wh where um, we are already in contact with and uh, some others who will join. We we are open also in that way to uh, actually uh, build a statement, a case, some questions uh, all together. And of course, the more the merrier and the more relevant to be heard by such giants. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, let me just uh, conclude. Uh, telling you that we will restart the conference, the Media Mutations 12 conference tomorrow, uh, tomorrow at 10, both in person and uh, online. So feel free to join for another half day of very interesting discussions and speeches and panel 
devoted to the idea of the persistence of broadcasting in the digital uh, media arena. So see you, see you tomorrow. And thank you very much to all of you once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeroen. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Luca. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.